Thanks for coming to the very first talk. Uh, so I'm a new uh, faculty member here. I just joined in uh, September. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about a system we're developing uh, to make users' queries private on internet services. And we've got, we're basically using some new cryptographic techniques to make this um, very efficient. Uh, this is work I actually started with folks at MIT, and I'm continuing it here uh, and actually starting a bunch of new projects around it here as well. Um, so what's kind of the background in Splinter? Well, if you look at how people um, use uh, the internet, uh, a lot of the most common things you do on the internet are just querying large public data sets. So for example, uh, you're looking for directions on a map. Maybe you need to get here this morning and uh, you put in a start and end into Google Maps. Um, you're looking for food. You know, Maybe you want to have dinner tonight or something in Palo Alto. Uh, or you're planning travel and you have some dates when you want to fly somewhere. So in all these cases, you know, the data set is just some large data set out there. And you're mainly using this third party service to query it quickly. Now, the problem is with all these queries, you reveal uh, very sensitive information. Even when this data set is not you know, something private of yours like your email, the query is. So for example, you know, when you look in the map, people figure out where you live and where you're going. When you're looking here, they figure out where you want to travel and so on. And there are a lot of bad things that can happen with this private query information. Um, at the very least, you know, this information is going to be sold maybe to a network of advertisers and uh, uh, it's not clear how different ones of them will use it. Um, some sites will actually charge and treat users differently based on their browsing history or their query history or things like that. If you've ever searched for something on Google and then seen some ad chasing you around on every other website you visit, that's a thing. And you know, even if you're not worried about those two things, a, a, a major problem is that if any of these services um, is hacked by someone, uh, people have your query history of uh, potentially very sensitive queries. So uh, you know, even if the service providers are benevolent and you trust them and you like their privacy policy and stuff like that, there's still lots of personal information sitting up there across these things. So what we're looking at in this project is to check whether we can keep the queries to these online services private. And obviously, the most important thing to, to make this happen is going to be how to make it efficient. Uh, because you know, there, are, there are going to be lots of queries, and people expect it to be fast. Um, so th there are general techniques for uh, making these kinds of things uh, you know, private. For example, we could try some form of computation on encrypted data, or private information retrieval, or things like that. But they've traditionally been pretty expensive. Um, so in the design of Splinter, we have um, a, a different technique, uh, which actually requires having multiple providers. But using this technique, we can actually make private queries very efficient for many common applications. Um, so this is sort of the design. So we need several different providers uh, which are independent. So they could be, for instance, two companies that both host an online map data set, like OpenStreetMap, or they could be the same company with servers in different places. Uh, and the model we're envisioning is, you know, you pick the servers you like or you pick the companies you like whenever you do a query and you just need more than one. And then the user is going to make a parameterized query uh, to these nodes. And uh, basically, in the query, there are certain private parameters that we're hiding. So for example, you know, we're searching for restaurants on Yelp, but we don't want the service to know which city we're in and also which type of restaurant we like, because you know, maybe they'll be able to track us using that. So these are private parameters. And the trust model in Splinter is that um, any, basically uh, all but one of the servers uh, can be malicious. So as long as one provider is honest uh, and we do this protocol where we talk with all of them, uh, the other ones can't figure out the parameters of the query. If all the providers uh, are collude, then they can figure it out. But this is a pretty powerful model. It basically, you can connect to like your three favorite sites, you know, maybe in different countries, and as long as like, one of them is not compromised, you, uh, you can run these queries privately on a shared data set. So the parameters of your query stay private unless all the providers collude. 
Um, so that's, that's basically, th th these are the security properties. One thing I'll note is that malicious providers can still corrupt the results uh, by just not following the protocol, giving you back some, some kind of junk. Uh, and so if you want, you can try to defend against that. But the main thing we're looking at here is protecting your queries, not protecting you from, um, from invalid results. And the really exciting thing about uh, Splinter is the performance. So on a lot of real um, uh, uh, data sets that people may want to look at, we can get sub-second uh, latency, including the computation and the network traffic and, and all that stuff uh, on data sets of millions of records. So for example, we've used this for map routing and a map of New York City. It's a pretty big map and you can find directions without revealing your source and destination in about a second. We've used that for restaurant search on Yelp and we've used that for other applications too. And uh, the system has, a, it also has a very low communication cost in terms of number of round trips. So if you're running this on a mobile device or something, it only takes one or two round trips. So the cool thing about this, you know, the, the reason I'm excited about this is because, uh, you know, I, I normally work on big data. It's, you know, how basically there's always more data coming in, but, Given that, I think any data set that involves humans or places in the world or things like that is actually small data. Like a map of New York City is not gonna get bigger over time. A map of the world is only maybe a hundred times bigger than that. So uh, all, these, all these things are actually quite tractable, maybe with a few more generations of, uh, uh, of systems uh, to, to actually do very, uh, queries on, on very quickly. So how does it work? So uh, Splinter builds on this new cryptographic primitive that came out about two years ago called function secret sharing uh, that lets you divide the query into these opaque shares where uh, the servers can't reconstruct your query unless they have all the shares. And on top of this primitive, we built some new protocols to run more complex queries over it. So we support basically a subset of uh, SQL and we can uh, do things like max and min and top k and so on. Uh, and we also have an efficient implementation of FSS using the AES instructions on, um, on Intel um, uh, processors. Uh, and basically, uh, we're able to run it over sort of millions of records uh, in, in sub-second time. So I'll start by giving you a little bit of background on FSS. Uh, FSS uh, uh, is, a, is, is a technique that divides a function f into shares that it's going to give to servers. And the shares have several properties. So there are k shares. Uh, first of all, each share is small in size. So sending it over you know, isn't, isn't that expensive. And it can be evaluated pretty quickly. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and second, the, the sum of the shares fi is equal to to F. These functions return um, uh, elements over a group or something like that, and uh, the sum of them is always F. And finally, given any k, of, k minus one of the shares, you can't find a certain hidden parameter of f unless you're able to, you know, unless you can basically break one-way functions or uh, the, the other things involved in, in building this. Uh, so that's, that's what FSS means. Now, efficient FSS uh, protocols exist for two cases that we're going to build on in this project. Uh, the first one is point functions. So here you have um, f of x is one if x is a certain um, uh, secret value a and it's zero otherwise. And you can actually break this into shares so that the servers can figure out what a is. Uh, and then the second one is interval functions. So f of x is one uh, if x is somewhere inside the this interval from A to B, uh, and it's zero otherwise. So that's kind of what we have. And for these, you can actually build these using just AES, um, and, uh, and you can get these efficient uh, constructions. So that's, that's the basic function secret chain. So let's see how we can use this in queries. So a very simple example of a, a query, we're going to just uh, do a count. Let's count how many records you know, in a data set have item ID equals five. So for example, maybe we're searching how many products in, a, in the store are in category number five or whatever, and we want to keep the number five hidden. 
So here's how FSS is going to work. So basically, I'm just going to show it with two servers. Um, the two servers, um, you know, each have a copy of the data set. And the data set is just a table, let's say, with item ID and price. Uh, that's our simple uh, data set here. And we, we construct the function f of x, which is 1 if x equals 5 and 0 otherwise. And basically, what we need to do is sum up f of x over all the item IDs in the data. So we split f into these two shares, f1 and f2. We send them to the two servers, and they each apply their share to, to all the item IDs. Notice they both have the same data set. It's some public data set, like a map of the world or, or something like that. Um, and then they each give us back a sum. And because FSS is additive, uh, you know, they can each add up these Fs locally. And um, at the end, we, we get the sum of all of them, which is just the, the it's a one for every uh, item that, uh, you know, that was equal to five. So we get back our result. So here's an example of how it would execute on some data. Let's say we have item ID and price. Um, so the shares F1 and F2 uh, always add up to F. So in this case, F is equal to 1 when the item ID is 5, and it's 0 otherwise. But from the perspective of the servers, if you just see F1 or you just see F2, they look like arbitrary values in this group. So think of these as, say, integers, mod uh, 2 to some power or something like that. Um, so they just look like arbitrary values. But then they're set up so that, you know, across the servers, they add up. And at the end, when you add them up, you get a 1 for every O where this was 5, and you get a, a 0 otherwise, and you get back your result. So that's very basic use of FSS. Now, the nice thing about FSS is we can also um, start using it for more complicated queries, and that's what we developed in Splinter to support sort of these real applications. Um, so as a next step of an example of a, a more complicated query, we're going to do a sum. So this is the same as before. Instead of counting the data where item ID equals 5, we want to compute the sum of prices where item ID equals 5. And to do that, we can just take what we were doing before, computing F on each item, and multiply it by the price. So here we're going to get you know, F of item ID 1 times price 1, F of item ID 2 times price 2, and so on. And because these things are over, um, uh, you know, over, over a group, uh, basically, you know, we can do these multiplications, and all the ones where F um, adds up to, to 0 will just cancel out. And so we'll get back the prices just of the things that, uh, that matched F without the servers having to know which ones those were. So that's, again, using the additivity of, um, of FSS. And we can get back to sum. And apart from these counts and, price, uh, and, and uh, sums, uh, in Splinter, we uh, support a, a more general, basically, kind of subset of SQL. Um, so we're able to select various types of aggregates from the data uh, with a given condition. We're also able to do grouping uh, by some expressions. Um, and for the aggregates, we can do these kind of additive things, like uh, count and sum and average and so on. Uh, but we also design protocols to do max and min and top K. Um, so things like, you know, find the best uh, Italian restaurants near me. Uh, that's something that we can do. Uh, histograms and uh, a few other types of things that are covered in our, um, in our paper about this. Um, for the conditions, we support the two basic conditions on point functions. Um, we also support uh, an AND of a bunch of equals and, and an interval. Uh, and we also support an OR of disjoint conditions. So this covers a lot of common things that people may want to do. And for the expression, we can, uh, we can select any public function of the fields in the home. Like I was showing price before, you could select something uh, more complicated. Uh, because the only part that we're trying to keep private is the condition, not the expression. So that's kind of, uh, that's kind of the model. So I'll just show a few other places of, uh, a few other examples of how we use this. Uh, and then I'll show some, uh, some results about performance. Um, so, th the next thing after sum and count um, that's slightly more complicated is max. So, um, let's uh, imagine we want to select the maximum of some expression where some condition holds. You know, the condition could be item ID equals 5 or something like that. 
Um, so basically, in all these things, the, the best execution plan depends on the condition class. So we actually have uh, different cases for that. Um, so we could have a condition that's just an equality, we could have an interval, uh, or we could have an, a disjoint or of intervals. Um, and I'll just show it for a few of the cases. So if we've got just a single value condition, so select max where a bunch of, a, a bunch of the fields concatenated together equal a certain value, um, then we can actually compute this by, uh, by doing uh, kind of two steps. So first, each provider can, can compute the max for every value of that condition. Um, so that's just doing kind of a max and group by. And this can be done in linear time. You just scan through the table and you say for, for every possible value of that hidden parameter, what is the max? And then now we get a table with these uh, E expressions and then the, the max value. We can use a point function to select just one row from it. So we can create a function that's one on, on the value A and zero otherwise, and just return this in the same way we did the sum of prices. So that's one, you know, one, one simple case of doing this. We just build this intermediate table then query it. Uh, it turns out even for more complicated um, uh, conditions, it's also possible to, to get the result efficiently. So in the next kind of case is uh, if we have an interval. So now we want to select the max of a certain expression where some other condition, you know, some, some value is inside an interval. And we can actually do this by um, building this, um, this, uh, uh, this uh, sorted table of, of intervals. So basically we can first um, first select the, you know, the, the value that we're looking at and then the E0 in order. So maybe these are the values of, um, you know, of, of, uh, uh, basically these are the values of E0 for the, the different possible values of E1 up to ET of the condition. And this is a table. And now, you know, we're looking for this thing to be in an interval of the table. So we want, say, the interval from here to here or something. We, we want to select the max over some interval of the table. But we don't know which one it is and we don't want to reveal it uh, to the server. So what the servers can do is they can build not just one table, but a bunch of tables of intervals of different sizes. So the size two intervals, size four, and so on. And they can compute the max of, on each one from the ones above. And again, this can, also, this can be done in linear time. So uh, basically, now for any power of two interval, we have the max of it. And then if we want to select a specific interval, uh, we just kind of need to do two things. First, we need to find the start and end positions of it. So where in this list T um, do we have the, the interval from A to B? So for example, um, in, in this case, maybe we want this interval from three to six. So we just um, uh, figure out the index where, uh, you know, where, uh, where these two values are. Um, and then we need to select at most two intervals of each of those sizes. So any interval you want can be covered by up to two intervals of size one, two intervals of size two, two intervals of size four, and so on. So the, the short story here is basically you need two point functions that can be sent at the same time for this first round, and then log n point functions for the second round. Uh, so you just need two rounds of communication and you can pull out the max over any interval you want uh, using these intermediate ones. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, final kind of example uh, is if you have this disjoint condition. So now in this case, you don't know anything about the, uh, the values where the condition is true. You can't sort by them or anything, so you can't pull out an interval. Um, but you can do other techniques. So for example, you can sort the data by the value you're pulling out, uh, and then you can use a binary search uh, overhead to find the first index in the table where the condition holds. So these are just some examples of, of how we can use FSS. Oh, yeah? What is the prior implementation The condition is private. So yeah, I should have, uh, yeah, I basically, um, so if you go back here, only the, con the parameters of the condition are private. The, the, these are the secrets, yeah. But the, the structure of the query is known. So for example, they'll know that you're looking for the cheapest flight to somewhere, but they don't know where. Okay, yeah. Cool, yeah, so these, these, are, these are, you know, these are um, just some examples of, of doing this. 
Um, so we actually built protocols to do this for uh, different types of aggregates and different types of queries, and this table shows the, the complexity of each one. And the main point to take away from this is that um, all of them take time at most n log n, where n is the size of the database. So you do have to scan through the database once or maybe sort it, and that's just necessary because you don't want to reveal which item you're pulling out. But again, as I said at the beginning, these databases are small data. I mean, a, a million items, even a billion items, you can scan through it on, uh, on a multi-core processor pretty quickly. So that's, that's actually not too bad for a lot of data sets people care about. And then the communication rounds are up to log n, and in most cases, they're just one or two. And also the bandwidth cost is, uh, again, up to log n. So these are pretty, uh, pretty fast and, and pretty practical to implement uh, uh, on real hardware. And just to give you a sense of how it performs, here are some results uh, you know, from the work on different uh, queries and different types of data. So uh, we, we ran this on a bunch of data sets shown here at the bottom, uh, basically a Yelp data sets, uh, database of all the flights available in the US, and also a map of New York City with all the, uh, all the nodes and edges in that. Um, and um, uh, so these data sets range up to a few hundred megabytes in our, in our case. Uh, and if you look at the queries, this shows all the, um, all the different um, uh, costs of it uh, for both two parties and three parties. The FSS implementation is a bit different. Uh, but the point is the response time for all of them is you know, up to 1.2 seconds. So it's pretty practical. And this is end-to-end -end response time talking to a server on EC2 from, uh, you know, from a laptop that's 14 milliseconds uh, away. Um, and uh, the, the communication size is at most you know, a few kilometers kilobytes for most of them. Query size is also, um, in most cases, pretty small. Um, so uh, in, in a lot of these cases, we can actually do these queries pretty practically. And the final thing I'll mention is that uh, FSS is also um, kind of embarrassingly parallelizable within a node. So we mostly use one core for these experiments, but you can use multiple cores or even a, a GPU or something like that and make it run even faster. We actually want to try implementing that in the future. Okay. So to conclude, this AnyTrust model where uh, you, know, you, you have a bunch of providers of the same data set and you just need one of them to be honest uh, is very practical, especially compared to stuff like garbled circuits or other ways of computing unencrypted data. It's very practical for a large class of applications. And again, as I'm saying, the reason I'm excited about these is that these applications are small data. They're not going to get bigger over time. So even something that takes, say, 10 seconds today is going to be extremely practical in the future. And we think it can be used both within an organization, say with geographically distributed servers, and across organizations. And in ongoing work, we're actually trying to uh, specialize this uh, idea more for, uh, for specific types of data that are expensive to query, such as maps or text search. So we think we can come up with uh, even uh, faster protocols for some of these. And if you want to find out more about it, we have a full paper that appeared at uh, NSDI just a few weeks ago. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? Will come up and plug in his computer while you're sure. Somebody must have a question. Alan, always reliable question. Okay. So what kind of useful queries can't you support? Yeah, good question, yeah. So, so um, the most useful thing that we couldn't support right now is actually text search, uh, at least not in a, a very efficient way. So basically, we looked at the UIs of you know, Yelp, uh, Kayak, these type of sites, and uh, the one thing we couldn't do is free text search. Uh, you can do free text search, for example, by treating each word as a separate column in the data or stuff like that, but uh, especially something where you're looking for multiple words together or something doesn't, uh, doesn't work very well. Um, the other, yeah, I guess the other thing I'll mention is uh, basically, um, you know, I mentioned the OR of disjoint conditions. The OR of overlapping conditions is also pretty hard to do with uh, this type of additive FSS because you end up adding something in twice. But text search was the most useful one that we want to improve. Yeah. A question here. Um. Oh. Oh, you can go ahead, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So one more quick question. 
Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you've concentrated on the performance of the back end. Can you comment on the client side? Is there any, uh, are, are there any conditions when the client side can be bottlenecked? Uh, no, so, so what the client is doing, generating the FSS uh, shares is actually very fast. Uh, so uh, so the, the, end to, the time here included the time the client computes. The client was a laptop here, but it included the client computing something, sending its query, and getting it back. So it's pretty fast. They don't need to do, they don't need to do any public key stuff or anything like that. Yeah. Cool. Anything else? Okay, great. All right, thanks a lot.